I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. My guests today are Drs. Victor Krebs and Richard Frankel. They're here to discuss their new book, Human Virtuality and Digital Life, Philosophical and Psychoanalytic Investigations, published by Rutledge 2021. Dr. Krebs is a full professor of philosophy at the Pontifical Catholic University of Peru. You can follow him at Twitter and Instagram at Synchronicity23 and visit his website vjk5555.wixsite.com slash portafolio. That's P-O-R-T-A-F-O-L-I-O. Dr. Frankel is a faculty member and supervisor at the Massachusetts Institute for Psychoanalysis and teaching associate and supervisor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. You can visit the Massachusetts Institute for Psychoanalysis website at mipboston.org. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious, Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry. Published by Trapar Books, 2019. For more, please visit our publisher's website, trapar.net. That's T-R-A-P-A-R-T dot net. You can follow me at Twitter and Instagram at raw sin underscore that's r-a-w-s-i-n underscore at twitter and instagram or follow me on tiktok at dr vanessa sinclair 23 you can support the podcast at our patreon patreon.com forward slash vanessa 23 carl your support is greatly appreciated thank you so much to all of our Patreon patrons. Well, I mean, I mean, there's, there's, there's the, the, there's the experience we had of writing it. I think that that's important. You know, how, how we came about uh, thinking about the topics and how we had the experience of writing first face to face and then virtually because I live in Peru and Richard lives in, in Boston. So, so most of the, our work we did uh, virtually, and we started about five years ago when Zoom was not the big thing. So we were doing Skype, <laughs> Skype and a Google Doc, and and we discovered how we could, you know, write together at the same time, and that was like a really interesting experience because we realized that in the virtual, our connection, the way in which we thought together, was much more plastic, much more malleable. I mean, sometimes we 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 started writing. Uh, the same paragraph and then we would each take off you know and a little uh, take five minutes off and each one would write something and come back with it and suddenly we realized we're saying the same things but from different perspectives and that i think is one of the important things about the book that it draws from two perspectives we could call it or two dimensions of experience one is the psychoanalytic and the other one's a philosophical and since we've been talking about this since we were in undergraduate school um our language is pretty much a mix of both, right? I mean, I learned psychoanalysis as he was learning, doing his discipline, and he learned a little bit of philosophy too through me. So it's kind of a, an interesting experience. That, it, yeah, that's that's yeah. what I would start talking about. Yeah, and I guess, I guess the thing I would add what, what Victor was saying in terms of the way that the the paragraphs sort of started to write themselves, we might say it like it, it really didn't feel like it was my consciousness or Victor's consciousness, but some kind of shared thing would happen vis-a-vis the aliveness of the virtual, I think. There really was something about writing the book that way. But two other things occurred to me about it. One was just the experience we had of a kind of intimacy that grew in the virtual, a kind of way that um, 
feelings could really genuinely flow between us, conflicts could be attended to, there could be like a lively affective field created in that virtual space. And then we would meet each other in person. And when we met each other in person, it was absolutely vanished. And we were back to like two older men with their bodies and their troubles and like back on earth and back on the ground. And then it was about how, where did that intimacy go? How is it different when it's an embodied contact? And th those are really big, big questions that we tried to explore in the book out of those experiences. Big issues, big issues of yeah. the, the embodiment of the encounter, which changes. Uh, and, and as time has gone by, we've gone through different ways of formulating it and, and experiencing it also. But there was also another experience that, that was kind of fascinating because at the beginning, when we first, you know, in all our lives, I've been very pro-technology. He's been very anti-technology, just to simplify things, right? So when we came together, suddenly we found ourselves each taking the position of the other sort of naturally. So in a way, this also defined the methodology that we discovered needs to be uh, adopted for a discussion on the, on the technological. And perhaps that takes us to our, to our first issue, the most important thing, and it is our conception of technology as a pharmacon, yeah. something that you, you know, we bring from Plato, but of course Derrida worked on it uh, more. And then and, and Stiegler, uh, Bernard Stiegler, uh, even expanded more. So the pharmacon is an important thing that, that we, and what does it mean for technology to be a pharmacon? No? Yeah, how did you come to that? Yeah, uh, well, um, for, first of all, that it's that the pharmacon is neither good nor bad. I mean, it's not good, good or bad. It's both. I mean, it's a single phenomenon that has as it were, two sides, you know, the, the yeah. dark and the, and the light, they're, and they're interconnected. You can't have the one with the other. And for technology, to that it is a pharmacon means that it has a potential both to be poisonous and uh, curative. And, but that, that depends on how you manage the elements that constitute this paradox. And that, uh, and that also has to do with, with our relationship to, to our own unconscious, no? uh, because it is an extension of ourselves. That's an, another issue that we, we would like to, to talk about, uh, about how technology is not something external to us, it is imposed on us, but rather it's something that grows from us. And as it, as it grows from us, and it's necessary that we look at it as we look in, at human individuals and societies, both from a conscious and an unconscious level. That's great. Yeah. yeah, as we talked about in the beginning before we were recording, I really love psychoanalysis and I really love the arts. And there's an artist named Stellark out of Australia, and he works a lot with like body modification and technology. And he says, you know, when people say like, oh, we're not human anymore, he says that, you know, having technologies and tools is what has always made us human, even language. And he sees those all as technologies and things that are extensions of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. I also love this idea that you brought up um, where you both have your two kind of individual perspectives, but then you created this kind of third perspective that like work together in the virtual sphere and other artists that are writers that I also really love are William Burroughs and Brian Geisen and they had this concept called the third mind, where they said that when two minds come together in a creative co collaboration, they create this third mind and then that mind kind of takes on a life of its own and has its own kind of trajectory that's not yes. either but is also both of them. So it's right. really fun. They did that through the working together with cut-ups and, and the arts, but it's great to hear that you can also do that kind of through this virtual sphere of writing. Yeah, it, it, that's very interesting. That's a very good description of what actually happens. I mean, Richard was saying, yeah, suddenly it was not we that were writing. The, the, thing, the text itself acquired a life in virtuality. And perhaps that's also part of the experience we had of shock almost, of coming back together face to face. Suddenly that was not present. And so how do you find that so easily as you do in in in, in the virtual uh, realm yes. uh, in, re in reality, right? Uh, yeah. I was going to just just say one other thing about the pharmacon, just sort of that basic. We could say it was our method. It was our working method. So we ex we had an experiential version of it, right? As we were talking about the way that uh, something that I held on to, some belief that I had about technology. There's interesting, I mean, if you even think about it in terms of our political polarization right now, there was something about this shared virtual space that allowed me 
to let go of it and actually really delve into the opposite perspective. And that's the thing about technology. It's always producing opposites, right? You're always in some kind of play of oppositions. And that's why the writing on technology is often so polarized. See that in the polarization, if you really think it is pharmacological, the polarization gets you absolutely nowhere in trying to come to terms with the technological world. Because all it's doing is promoting uh, one side, its, its ills or its goods as being better than the other and blind to the other side and blind to the interfusion of the two perspectives. So, so just, just one of the thoughts, we, we really have noticed this when we've presented the book, that very what, what, what will happen in the audience is almost like unconsciously the polarization creeps in and that the discussion either becomes about the pros or the cons, one or the other. And then it's very difficult to get people to move and shift into this other pharmacological position. Yeah, like you said, the book, it just becomes an argument. An argument, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and things break down. And I, and I think that's a good way of thinking about it. We don't want to argue. I mean, if we, from the beginning of the book, we say we are not arguing for anything. In fact, we even use concepts that we acquire from philosophers. We don't, we don't claim to be accurate in what we're representing from the philosophers. We're trying to get something from them that gives us insight into what, what we're uh, discussing. Yeah. Right. So, so, so this, I, I think that is, that is very important. The pharmacological, we call it the pharmacological method is just being aware that whenever you start to argue for something positive about it, you have to also look at what it has bring it what it brings with it that's negative that's that, that, that needs to be dealt with so that these so that the uh, method is more more like a, a holding of the tensions rather than a resolving of the op opposites yeah or or, or in in um, other psychoanalytic language it might be in thomas ogden's language it might be trying to find a third between these two poles right it, we're always we're always looking to write in that third position, and that that's why the book sometimes can feel a bit uh, like you're on a roller coaster. Like, where are these guys coming from? Right. <laughs> so we're, we keep trying to stay right in that middle position, and it's yeah, schizophrenic. We sometimes call that those. You know, <laughs> schizophrenic. Here we are right. arguing for it, and suddenly we're starting arguing against it. So uh, there, there's a concept in in Ortega y Gasset, the, the Spanish philosopher, uh, where he says that we are ontological centaurs, which is very nice because it, it gives you this, this sense that we are in fact a paradoxical com complex. And I think that that complex is transferred into technology insofar as technology is an extension of ourselves. But, but that means what? That we are always living between the material and the virtual, always. And the virtual has all these possibilities and material has all these limitations. How do you, how do you in a way balance them? How do you keep them together? How do you not you know, polarize them and 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 sacrifice one part of of the uh, of the uh, nature of, of human nature. Yeah, and and, there, and and there's so many versions of that ontological center, that image. I mean, if 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 you go back to famously to Ernest Becker in the denial of death, how does he describe the human being? He says we're gods with anuses. So again, I think it's that same that same tension you're talking about, Victor. Yeah. It couldn't be more, more poignant <laughs> image. Right, right, right. Yeah. And of course, yeah. then brings in mortality. And, and then to think about just how essential this whole discussion about technology, its relationship to death, to the denial of death, at times to the avowal of death and contingency, again, really both what it's doing to our relationship with mortality. And, and, and this, and this uh, reference to death, I think that, that seems somehow so you know, off-putting in a way. To some people, it's just like, wait, what? We're talking about technology. Why are we talking about death? I think that it, it's essential. It's essential to an understanding of, of what's going on in technology because it has to do with uh, coming to terms with our mortality. I mean, so much so that virtuality offers this illusion of a total uh, you know, liberation from all our limitations, uh, which if you think about it, if technology is really a pharmacon, it really cannot, you cannot change its its composition, which is paradoxical, then, then uh, that possibility that it offers us has to be compensated with the, with the material limitations that we have. And that is coming to terms with our mortality, right? I mean, part of the, of the reflection then is, is, uh, has, makes it uh, so philosophical in so, insofar as it touches on the very most basic 
condition of uh, humanity with its which is its mortality and therefore you can understand for instance the way we understood the world up to now up to now in the digital revolution uh, as made up of substances that are permanent and temporality is just something that goes over them but but there's something per whereas the digital is changing that reversing that so we're starting to see that really things are processes and that this, these notions, these substances, they're just transitional kind of uh, concepts that we use in order to live there. But somehow digitality is forcing us to understand and accept and integrate the temporality of things and therefore to see wor the world as fluid rather than static. And so that, and, and that sort of, starts to explain a lot of things that are happening right now. I mean, like, you know, this you know, notion of gender fluidity, for instance, how we conceive, we, we start to recognize the plurality, the multiplicity in human nature uh, that goes against that notion that we had of stable substances. Mm -hmm. So there's also kind of a metaphysical transformation that goes on with our experience of the virtual, of the digital virtual. And, and, and you know, Vanessa, we were talking about clinical practice before before we started. I mean, think about the way, think about what has been revealed about psychoanalysis and psychotherapy as a result of us doing it online, right? Couldn't you say there's something about a different kind of fluidity, a different kind of temporality that happens when you're having, even knowing someone virtually, not even having ever met them in person, and then conducting the analysis virtually, right? You could say from Victor's point of view, it's that process like that, that the, the appearance of those processes are manifest and things are moving in a very different way. And then you could also think about, okay, that, that really offers something, right? That really creates new possibilities, new modes of connection. And then you think, well, what was different about when therapy took place between two people in the same room? And maybe, maybe Victor, that's your version of substances, right? What, is it, what does it mean to feel embodied with someone in a more substantial way than in this quicksilver virtual world? And, and again, it's so quickly can get polarized, right? So right. If, if you say this to a therapist, 50% of therapists will say, you know what? It was so much better in person. There's such a loss here on the screen. I can't feel the other person's psyche. Something doesn't come alive that happens when we're in the room together, right? And they bemoan that we're in this mode. And the other half of the therapists will say, you know, I've gotten to a place with my patient. <laughs> that I never got when we were together in the room together, right? So immediately, again, you, how do you hold the tension of those two sides? Yeah, no, I was thinking about that when you were saying that you would get all of this work done online and then you'd meet and you'd be like met with each other's like bodies and neuroses and uh, right. reality, you know? And I was thinking that because so many people like it is such a rush to go back to the office and say like, oh, but it's not the same as two bodies in the room and the bodies speak to each other and all this right. kind of thing. But like maybe, you know, you can also say there's all these different pros for the virtual space and maybe there's some sort of less inhibitions or something when you're not a body in a room with somebody else and you're able to go to places you're not able to go so absolutely but but then then we might say one of the but then one of the big issues that's happening now just on on this topic you know I, from all the therapists you know i sort of speak to supervise colleagues right patients don't want to come back especially young ones so what does that mean <laughs> <laughs> is this going to be it now? And is the other thing going to be like a specialty you might have, an in-person? I specialize in seeing people in person. You know, it's going to become a whole new subspecialty or something. But what, well, is, what does it mean to lose that? It, it, it just means that this is, this is the way things are changing. There's no way back. So that it's like a new dimension has been added. And, and, and I think that the, the, the best attitude to, 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 to have with regard to that is to see what new possibilities it is adding to what we have rather than seeing it as a subtraction. I mean, I, I, I think for instance of, of the phenomenon of Twitter. I remember I joined Twitter about 15 years ago, I know very early on uh, in Peru. I mean, it's probably later, it was later than in other, other parts of the world, but there it was early. And I remember that one of the things that struck me about Twitter was that people were starting to say things in public that they would never have said before. Even if their identities were there, the fact that their bodies were not perfect, perhaps, perhaps that we were meeting in a, in a virtual space where 
laws were different or whatever, uh, suddenly we were starting to talk about things that we would have never confess to any except our most intimate friends. And it became a public discourse. And so I think that that has a, the effect of amplifying the range of things that we can think of as a society, which is being allowed because of this new virtual uh, you know, condition in which we, we find ourselves. Yeah. No? Now, I, I just wanted to, to, to point out an, an, another one of our, our basic concepts, and that, and that is the notion of virtuality. Because I think we, we think of virtuality as digital virtuality, as if it just appeared with virtual reality. And so it's changed all our world. But it really, when, when we were writing the book, we realized that as we go through the history of the media, every new media has transformed the virtual in us. In other words, that there is something virtual about human beings, as Ortega said, said where there's something physical and something, he says, natural and supernatural, which is not, I think, the terminology we need now, but that there is something real, empirical, and something virtual, right? And, and that this virtuality has been present with us from the moment we could think a world beyond the present experience, that we could abstract the world from the temporal that we could consider possibilities that were not there, right? And if, and if you think of, of the virtual that way, then the virtual has been with us from the moment we had consciousness, from the moment we painted some scene that we had seen, we painted it, that's, that's a virtual. Uh, from the moment we started writing, that page is virtual, or the movies, or whatever else you can think of a, as a modulation. So, so every single new... Uh, medium has merely modulated differently the virtual in us. So if you see this, see it that way, then the lessons we can learn from the virtual here are retroactive. You start thinking about them in terms of of what happened before, and I think I think that's that's useful. Yeah. In, yeah. In, exactly. Now I was yeah. thinking that too because you know I had been thinking that um, there's no philosophers like all the philosophers and analysts that we that we always point to, none of them lived in this kind of world, you know, in this kind of digital world. So we're in new territory in that way. But then when I started your book and I saw that you discussed that, but then you're like, but wait, they have always addressed this kind of virtual aspect and we can use them because of this and this. Makes a lot of sense. Makes me feel more grounded also. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and there's another, another uh, means by which we ground our, our thoughts, and that is by use of myths. I don't know if you myths and examples from movies and, 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 and TV series, because I think we find, we find uh, very interesting ways of thinking about these issues. For instance, uh, Greek mythology has, of course, the, the myth of Prometheus, right? We know that technology is Promethean, but what does that mean? And, and, and if you think about the myth, the myth starts with Epimetheus, which is the slower brother, you know, he's not very quick as, as Prometheus is, is a, a hero. And he is assigned the task of endowing all creatures with those powers and faculties that would make, uh, allow them to survive. And so he gets so excited with the job that he starts he's just giving away all these. And when it comes to time for human beings, there's nothing left. So the myth tells you from the beginning, humanity is precarious existentially in a way no, no other creature is. And so that's where the Titan Prometheus comes to save us. And how does he save us? He gives us the, 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 the fire of the gods, which is what? Reason and techne, the ability to make things. And to make things in order to survive, which means we can now, we're, as, uh, as Stigler says, we're exosomatic. We are able to produce parts of us, you know, extensions, prostheses of us that will make us more able to survive. So you see that the te te technological in the myth is nothing but a compensatory element in our nature that allows us to grow in a from within to towards the outside, right? To be able to handle reality in a way that other creatures don't. And this is what gives us. So in a way, technology has to do with our precariousness. It compensates for it, yeah. right? Yeah. And so the myth really kind of brings that brings that to uh, to the ground, you know, to 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 put some, put some anchors it into the reality. I think. Yeah, and, and then I, and then I think we take the jump from there to say that 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 
our precariousness is the very thing that psychoanalysis is trying to disclose. And part of our precariousness is having an unconscious, right? Our tendency towards disavowal, our tendency towards narcissism, right? That, that's what makes us precarious as psychological beings. And there's so many interesting ways that you could say technology both gives us new means for coping with that precariousness on the one hand, right? And all the creative uses of technology to open up and expand the human psyche. On the other hand, it has the tendency to hyper-realize those very elements of our precariousness, like our narcissism, for example, the way it magnifies our narcissism or uh, ushers it in, in in a way that sort of allows it to have much a larger and a bit more of an unwieldy life and something that we can't quite recognize. Same for our tendency towards disavowal, right? Uh, the whole idea of the virtual world on the one hand is that it really allows you to disavow empirical reality. Now we're, we're disavowing empirical reality all the time, but it's this hyper-realization that happens uh, that really makes, makes the question about our precariousness really come to the fore. What's it doing to this? What, what's it doing to the, the vulnerability of human beings? And, and when we have the worries about what it's doing to children, that's the way that that question gets framed, right? Children is the blank slate, is the vulnerable, the innocent. And what does it mean then that they're interacting with these machines? Victor, did you want to say something about that image? Oh, before, before I say something yeah. about that, I, I just wanted to add another myth, which is yeah. very clear about this danger in, in, in technology or, or you know, this openness of virtuality in human existence, no matter what stage. And that is the myth of Icarus. Icarus is a representation of the human that has acquired this potency of technology. He's able to, to now fly. But of course, the danger is that he, if he gets too close to the sun, there are limits, right? But what happens in, in the possession of this you know, hyper-reality that is being able to fly, he, uh, Icarus is totally blinded to the limits. He forgets about the warning he got from his father saying, don't, don't fly to, because your wings are made of wax and you will fall. He forgets about that. Well, that forgetfulness, which is also part of the ubris that comes with technology, you know, have power, suddenly you have this you, omnipotence and you forget about your limits. And that is a peril of technology that's intrinsic to technology. So, so we have to be aware of that uh, when, when we, we think about it, right? Yeah. So I think that brings back to uh, our everyday experience. This, I remember, I remember when I was a kid, I, I was, when I, I got my first car, it was, you know, 21, 22, and I was uh, poor, right? And, and I remember the moment I felt the power of the engine, I forgot about laws, I forgot about danger, a 21 year old. And I, I remember I had my friends in the car and we, and we went for a ride and I was just going, you know, 100 miles per hour in the middle of the city, totally reckless. Okay, that's the omnipotence that blinds you and makes you reckless. And you know, it, it gives you into peril, the, the most terrible peril. <laughs> right, but, 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 has taken over. but take that image now with the engine and think about a 13 year old with a cell phone, with, a, with an iPhone. Think of what, what power he, he or she has in their hand with that iPhone, like the engine and the directions it can take one in. And think how about. blind they can become. Right. Do you remember that that uh, there was this? Uh, I think we mentioned at the beginning. There's this video that we saw the other day on the internet of this little kid, about eight months old. You know, he's, he can't even walk yet, and and he's got a an iPhone, which is almost as large as his head. He's looking at it, and he, you see this eerie image of of the light on and the and then there's a babysitter. I hope it's a babysitter, not the mother, that takes the thing away from him, and he he has a tantrum. He's totally, totally you no know, possessed by his fury that he doesn't have it, and so so she gives it to back to him, and he's back to normal. And she does this like two or three times. Well, Richard and I were horrified by the image, but it tells you something very, very deep about what technology's power is over us. Right. Yeah, and, I, and I, I, yeah. Sorry, it's on a piece. 
No, I was just going to say, I never had children, but my husband has a daughter and I guess she was like 16 when we got together and now she's 23. But uh, no, I was thinking of that because it's like, she's grown up with these things with the phone. And, you know, if, if her phone, we've never taken it from her, but <laughs> if her phone is like lost or broken for like a moment, I mean, yeah. it almost feels like her identity is shattered. It's like, it's almost yeah. like she disappears. She like really freaks out, you know? And it's like, then that gets me thinking about like how people are forming their identities online and using it as this kind of mirroring. And if that disappears, it's like, almost like a threat to their like existence. Yes, totally. totally. There's, there, I would like you, Richard, to talk, talk a little bit about the transitional object, because I, I think that's one of the contributions of the book, that it, ma it, it manages to bring, it brings Winnicott in, yeah. uh, who got wonderful theorizing about, about, about this issue, that is so pertinent to what is going on, precisely on, on this matter. Yeah, but I think, I think, just to come back to a point Vanessa had said earlier about you know, that you are happy to think that the virtual perceives virtual reality and that actually these philosophers and analysts were talking about it. And I think, I think we make the claim in the book that actually Winnicott was, was the psychoanalyst slash philosopher of the virtual, which is, I mean, that he was really always talking about virtuality, especially when he was talking about potential space mm -hmm. and about that kind of intermediate space between fantasy and reality. We could say, between the virtual and the real, or what, you know, he's, as, as is Freud too, what is the relationship between the virtual and the real, between imagination, our inner lives in the external world, and where's the space between, right? And, and, the, and the question in Winnicott is always how the transitional object transforms into transitional space, because of course, for the child at some point, the object's discarded, and interestingly enough, uh, it's not mourned. It's just let go of. And when it's let go of, the capacity to open to the transitional experience becomes a reality as you grow through development, right? But Winnicott in, in the paper Transitional Phenomena talks about how there's two paths with the transitional object. One is it can be discarded and you can discover transitional space. And the other is it becomes a fetish object. Right, and it's something that you can't let go of, and it's something that makes it the only way for you to find transitional space is through the object, and everything becomes reified then, and it's the root of addiction, because then you need that object to open up the world, and you can and you can so much see how even in people's uses of technology, you could ask the question: Is it a fetish object or is it a transitional object? See, so is that something now as analysts that we have to kind of contend with? actually thinking about that the patient's use of technology as something that's part that needs to be analyzed as well or something that opens the analysis up because it it raises these very fundamental questions that didn't used to be located in that space before the digital revolution um, I, I i want to bring I, I would just mention uh philosophically something that is relevant to, to what richard is saying and that has to do with with this power of of the say um, uh, the digital object, but I think any object. I mean, if you think of the baby, the baby will have the same reaction to the cell phone that he, the iPhone that he's holding, to a toy that you take away from him. Because for the for the boy, there's something about reality that has this aura about it. And and Benjamin talks a lot about Walter Benjamin talks about the aura of the object and how that's lost with technology. Now, that's a big issue. I think, I think, I think he was too quick to, to say that, although he never says exactly that. He always, you know, is, is trying to be as, as faithful to the ambivalence of it. But if you think about technology in terms of the aura, then there is something that technology, the digital, is it, the digital technology is able to do with the objects that it hyper realizes that aura, that power, so that there is something about that screen that makes it a particularly perilous with regard to any other objects, which means we know it's the potentiation of the world that we are witnessing with technology all the time. But this time we have to learn how to deal with it. And I think, for instance, we talk about narcissism a lot in the book, because I think that's, that's, that, that, that's a central issue uh, that sort of revolves around that as well. How do we manage this, right? I mean, and, and there we use the, the myth of Narcissus also to talk about how, how that uh, 
that entrancement can be understood and how it can be in some way compensated for. Yeah, through the very myth itself, you'd say, Th through, through the role of echo. You know, echo is the one in love with Mar Narcissus and can only- Well, let, well let's, let's tell the myth. Let's yeah, tell please, the myth. Please say it, yeah. Um, but you're good at this too, so you should probably try it. Your your hand out. Come on, do it. You I'll, 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 I'll add whatever's needed to add. Narcissus. Okay. Well, well, how do we know Narcissus? Narcissus is totally entranced by the image of his own uh, appearance on the lake or on on a pond, and uh, that's the image we have, right? This image of of being totally entranced by the image that is projecting or reflecting something about you uh, and so we we, we uh, and so this is a myth the myth is he's 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 uh, he's, a, he's an enamored with his own image that's how we interpret it and then and then there is a myth a, a nymph that unfortunately for her has fallen in love with Narcissus who is totally entranced by himself a history, a story we can hear every day in the social media, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, girls falling in love with narcissists. Narcissus doesn't pay attention to them because it's obviously just in transism. So, but there's another handicap that the poor nymph has, and that is that Zeus used her because she was very good with words. She, she would really entertain you with a conversation and so forth. And so she sent her to distract Hera, Hera, uh, uh, Zeus's wife, while he was, you know, doing some of this, and um, you know, typical <laughs> Zeus, typical <laughs> Zeus uh, adultery, right? Uh, and uh, when Hera realized that this nymph had been helping her husband deceive her, she punished her and said, you will never be able to utter a single word of your own. You will only speak those words that are spoken to you, echo. So she could only be an echo. And so in the myth, she falls in love with Martin Narcissus. What could be more tragic than a nymph that couldn't talk, right? Could only relate to Narcissus in terms of Narcissus' words. So Narcissus <clears throat> at one point realizes she's there and, and says, you will never have power over me. And she repeats, power over me, power over me. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting about the myth is that that's suggesting that Narcissus starts to hear a voice that is different than his own, that is his own, but with a different meaning. So that possibility of changing things around seems to us to be the way in which digitality, for instance, can help us out of the trance in which it submerges us. But, you, but you're saying through being able to hear the echo in some way. Exactly, through, through its becoming an echo. So it's becoming, uh, there's, there's this writer, Willem Flusser, that we use a lot. He's a wonderful writer from the 80s. He died in the 80s, and he was a visionary, um, who says that, uh, um, what was the last thing that I said? <laughs> I, I, I missed my line. Uh, what were we talking about just now? The, the echo. Echo. No, I know, but, uh, oh yeah. And, and so this possibility of echo uh, turning the meanings around and right. triggering sort of a new occurrence uh that is something that digitality must do through what he calls envisioning which is a way of using imagination that is aware of how the digital works amongst which is for instance the notion of the aura the notion of this narcissistic connection that we have yeah right and, and, and even even and then one of the just one of the interesting reading of the myth right because psychoanalysis of course takes the myth myth in terms of self-absorption right the, the kind of what we we generally think of as narcissism but Lou Andre Salome that early um interlocutor with Freud said what's interesting about the myth is that Narciss Narcissus doesn't fall in love with himself but he falls in love with the world because of course he's not just looking at himself he's looking at himself reflected in the world as it appears in the pond so for, for, from that reading of narcissism, there's a way to get to the world, right? And we can think about, if we get, go back to the pharmacon again, again, of course, technology, I mean, what is so beneficial, the beneficial side of technology in the, in the use of social media is the way it opens, opens one to the world. It's, it's, it's the opposite of narcissistic self-absorption, right? It's allowing in the other in this radical new way one way to look at it and then of course you can see you can see the old one too that it it's entrapping one inside a world of subjective objects a world that's 
a world denuded of actual otherness, right? You can make that critique of it too. What's, it's a narcissistic world. And what, what we have to say always that both of those things are occurring. And how do you, when you're thinking about it, when you're, when you're working with a patient, how do you live in the tension of those two things? Maybe, maybe uh, psychoanalytically, that's the question is, how do you not collapse onto one side or the other in the analytic hour, which we're always trying to keep things open. But I say not difficult, right? Talking to a patient about technology, their, or their, tech, their uses of technology. We learn from them. We learn from them more than they can learn from us. Derrida says that there is not narcissism and not narcissism. He says there's various different kinds of narcissism, some that are more amiable and open to the other and some that are less so. So what we consider to be narcissism in that polarized conception is the narcissism that's totally closed to himself and you know, uh, unable to receive the other. Uh, but, in, but in this understanding of narcissism as having these two possibilities, then, then I think I love that because that means that we always say technology, digital technology is what it's doing is it's making people not totally narcissistic, right? And, and well, if narcissism has two sides to it, then maybe the selfie is not just a toxic thing. Maybe it's a way of other kinds of understandings and intuitions that can happen in that interaction between Narcissus and say the world that he's starting to love. And that, yeah, and that's, a, that's such a good, good example, right? Because isn't the most obvious thing about the selfie is it's the manifestation of, the, of a return to the culture of narcissism, right? Christopher Lash, like nothing embodies the narcissistic impulse in technology more than having to put your image everywhere and then sort of be entranced by it. But I think, I think what Victor's getting to is, isn't it necessary to think of it Think of something else, another angle on that to, and get out of that kind of just usual understanding that traps us. Well, and then and also the way the technology like changes us too, because like thinking of the selfie, like me, I'm a, I'm a little before growing up with the internet. So I'm not used to being like, oh, selfie, selfie. But like, if I take a pic, if I put a picture of your book up on Instagram, you'll yeah. get like 20 likes. But if I put my face there and I'm like, hi, here's your book, <laughs> then you'll get like a hundred likes. So I end up taking pictures like this so that your right. book gets more likes, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it changes my behavior based on what it does. That's really good, right. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you see that picture, that's why. You're like, yeah, right. get these guys book. <laughs> <laughs> You can understand, since we're connected to with Instagram, you can understand that even though I'm not from the generation that comes with digitality, I'm a totally selfish addict. A yeah, selfish addict, a selfie addict. Uh, You're fine. Right? No, no, no. But <laughs> this is my justification. I think that there are there are two sides to narcissism and are two aspects that you can play with. And so it's a matter. It's a it's a pharmacon. I, I mean, I may, I may be overdoing the you know the the negative side, but. Still, the experiment, I think, is, is, is on. And this is what we have to learn to, to take what is, going, what is going on and see what we can do to turn it around and make it positive. No, it's, it's, really, it's really true. We, did, we just presented the book to a group of, a psychoanalytic group. We, we'll, we don't have to say of what persuasion. It was very interesting. As soon as we started to sort of talk about a, as a pharmacon and maybe say some of the, the benefits of, the, of, of technology, and I think what we talk about is uh, allowing for a certain kind of laboratory of subjectivity, a laboratory of experimentation and um, allowing one to explore one's persona and its multiple forms, right? With one's online avatars and all of that, being inside the metaverse, right? All, all the creative possibility of that. Now, of course, we were trying to hold that with, with the darkness of it as well. But immediately, and this came around the, the, the um, issue of uh, cell phones with iPhones with with adolescents there was such a negative feeling about how the iPhone is destroying the adolescent psyche right and how and how these kids are stuck inside the virtual world and they have no experience with the empirical with nature and how there's no soul in it and the psyche is deadened by it 
and it and, and immediately as we were just trying to hold that there's another side to that and as a and as a parent if you only can see the negative first of all you lose your connection with the kid who's immersed in it that's the the first problem and then the other thing is that you miss that there's also something else going on that we not growing up in that generation don't know about or, or can't know about yeah so, right but what, what, what was interesting about that conversation was first of all i could understand because you have kids and you see what's happening to them and you don't know how to deal with this i mean this is this is why we need to educate ourselves with regard to it so if you don't know your first reaction is you want to protect your kids from what you're seeing is terrible i mean that's perfectly yeah. And so the fact that in this discussion, we got that response was that we were connecting to the mothers there, you know, uh, beyond what they were psychoanalysts, they were also mothers and this was just coming out. But what was interesting was that the conversation eventually turned and they started to, because, because it became so obvious. But the funny thing is, we finished our, our presentation with the most negative criticism of, of uh, digitality, which must have been for them like, oh, right. So they were on our side. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so how can this be? And so this is the schizophrenia of the book that I think is helpful to understand what it means to be pharmacological. Pharmacological means don't worry if you're contradicting yourself. Life is contradictory. <laughs> Exactly. The unconscious, everything exists in the unconscious. So right. I think right. people do need to learn how to hold the tension more because that's right. how it is. <laughs> right. and, and, and then, and then when we say that the digital has an unconscious or the digital is the unconscious or what, you know, whatever way, there's so many ways that you can formulate that. Right. But there is something so unconscious embedded in technology and our use of it. And to try to start to bring that to life. Right. 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 But this, is, this is, I don't think that this is something different than what we already discovered with psychoanalysis. It's just that we are discovering that technology is our extension. So if we are going to understand ourselves, we have to understand technology. And to understand technology, we have to understand it as we understand ourselves with this right. of the psychoanalytic. So there is a digital unconscious we have to be start to, to, to grasp and, and come to terms with. If we don't even acknowledge it, we're stuck forever. But that's so interesting because that was what that, that discussion with the, the moms who were very worried about their adolescents' use of technology. The way it was getting talked about is if the technology was something coming from the un, outside, right? And then impacting the children rather than technology, as we keep saying, is always an extension of ourselves. It's always has so much to do with our own disavowed hidden psychology. It's, it's embedded in it. Yeah. And that's, that's just shifting an orientation that I think is difficult to shift, but crucial. Technology yeah. is us. Absolutely. As much as we want to call, you know, think about the evil people behind it and the, the creators and the money making and the surveillance. And, but that's, that's the human psyche exomatized, right? It's, uh, yeah, excellent. So much. I, I, I uh, prepared a little paragraph here because I'm trying to get clear about what Stiegler is doing because Stiegler, Stiegler really is one of the, the best technologists, the most up to date, most conscious of what's going on. But he, he understands technology not as reducible to a technical artifact, something external to us, but he says as part of an entire human built environment. And that means, that means that technology, which he calls techniques, techniques, right, forms part of sort of a reticulated organic system, which is constituted by extensions of the human body, right, uh, by social structures, by uh, artifacts, by relations. So th this, he, he, so he, sa he, he says, we have to understand technology as an organological system in which there are all these elements involved that have to do with the most material and most empirical of human beings, the social, the cultural, the psychological, and of course, the material extensions. Of, of, so all this is technology. And technology is, is something that is just merely an extension of our organic self. And I think that's really a very good way to understand the complexity of technology, how we have to approach it with care, with care. I think that's also an important thing 
that we have to study things with care. These are not just theoretical matters. These are existential matters that we're dealing with now. So any theory that pretends to do something, it has to be engaged with what is, what is happening right now. Yeah, and I think psychoanalysis really needs to be engaged with technology because yeah. like you said in the beginning, Victor, like there's no going back. You're not going back to before, you know? So this is how it is now and it's going to keep evolving. And I feel like all the analysts that I know that are like rushing back to the office and, you know, we need to be two bodies in the room and everything. They need to hold space for the digital realm as well. And, you know, working through virtual means and things like that because, you know, psychoanalysis is so marginal as it is. And I feel like yes. this is such a ripe time for psychoanalytic thinking because the virtual space really allows us to understand these kind of psychoanalytic concepts. Like you said, the transitional yes. space and using it in that way or people understanding identity formation and yes. using it in that way and like fluidity and things like that. So I feel like we really need to like jump on that and harness those aspects to like help with the psychoanalytic understanding of it and also to help yes. understand ourselves better in that way rather than just being like, oh no, and like rejecting what's happening or rejecting the new, you know? And, and don't you think also to always be in that tension to, to, let, to let psychoanalysis read technology and help us understand something at a very deep level about technology, but also to allow tech, technology, the digital worldview to read psychoanalysis. Because mm -hmm. right? it opens up new dimensions of psychoanalysis by bringing that lens in. I mean, it, it's, the, it's the same creative play that's happening with race, isn't it? The, mm -hmm. the, the, psychoanalysis is an incredibly powerful lens to understand racism at this kind of core structural level. But it's also the discourse of, of racism is an incredible thing to bring to bear upon psychoanalysis and its hidden racisms and its history. And mm -hmm. you always want to be in that, again, that can, doesn't that get so easily polarized again between those two positions? One way to put it, and I, and I want to bring this down now to the philosophical, I feel like I'm over the overweight of psychoanalytic. I, the same exact thing is necessary to be said about philosophy. In order for to be, really deal with philosophizing about existence, about the world, we cannot uh, acknowledge the fact that the digital is, first of all, there's no way back, and secondly, that it is really transforming many of the ways that we have to, so instead of resisting it, we have to go along with it to see what is going on because the purposes of philosophy are now psychoanalytic. They're no different than it. But from, from a conceptual perspective, we have to redefine our concepts. It's necessary for us to, to do that. And I, and I think that that's something that the book is also trying to, to do, to bring uh, the, the reflection on, on digitality to philosophy or for a change of attitude also from the perspective of philosophy, because philosophy has been totally fixated with theory and, 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 and mentality and has disconnected itself from the body. Now, this is an issue that is very important in, in philosophy right now, the connection to the body, but it's, it's not universally as, uh, assumed. <clears throat> There's a whole you know, <clears throat> tradition that is still resisting it. And so I think that it's very salutary also for philosophers to start thinking psychoanalytically about what is going on with the digital. Yeah, and also in philosophy to be able to hold all these different kinds of concepts and not have this idea that like, well, because this philosopher said this and disproves this one, then this person is now wrong. It's like, it's not a contest, you know? Right. <laughs> There's lots of different ways of thinking about not, things. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not as it's, psychoanalysis isn't guilty of that as well, right? No, totally, exactly. Right. Read a right. lot of different theorists. It'll help you think about a lot of different yeah. things, a lot of different ways. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Don't have to just have one master. <laughs> but you realize that that competition is only possible when you see things from the perspective of the metaphysics of presence. Things are what they are. They are the same. But if you look at it from the metaphysics of processes or absences that we can, we, we want to say, <clears throat> Nothing is stable. Everything is, is, in, is in movement. Everything is changing all the time. So, that, so, so there, there is no way of holding on to concepts that will help, help you deal with the present. You just have to learn to think in the movement of time. That's, that's the, the world we're living is a world where the virtual and the real are no longer that separate. Which is, which is why we're, we're starting to write a second volume on precisely that issue of how our 
our experience and perception and understanding of what reality is, is totally confused. I mean, just to give you an example, I mean, I, sometimes I feel like I, I wrote Vanessa, I responded to her, right? And then, I, and then I'm wondering, did I think I was going to write it? Did I dream? No, what is it? And if I don't find it, I never know. Because sometimes you lose a, an email. Did I write it? Did I not write it? Did she get it? And so there, you leave yourself just to fate. Tomorrow, Vanessa will say, oh, I got you. Or she will never say anything. Well, you start to live kind of like in a flux. It's no longer, you know, something that's already predetermined. I think that's, that's, that's uh, what we're describing is the new ways in which we're dealing with time and space and with the other because the virtual has become part of our digital life. And, and also, just, just to say, it's also the, the, the new ways we're dealing with dreaming reality, right? Because it isn't the most eerie thing about virtual reality is the way it so mimics or simulates psychic reality where wishes can become actualized instantly, right? That happens in dream space and that happens in virtual reality space. So if that's happening in, in our life all the time now, there's a feeling that we're kind of living in a dream. And as Victor's saying, how do you then begin to come to terms with that? And how does reality start to change when there's this new kind of dream reality that's permeating everything? That, that, yeah, that's, well, what? I, yeah. I like what you said earlier too, but uh, that it makes you realize how much more malleable things are than people had previously yeah. imagined them to be. Yeah. And yeah. then you look at what's happening in, in, in the ge younger generations. They are holding the world from that perspective, not mm -hmm. from the perspective we have. They, that's how they're conceiving of things. It's like someone said, well, you have to, talking about what's happening in the world right now, you have to start having a post-war mentality. What does that mean? Well, that all the structures that have made order are not going to be there. So how do, you, how do you live? Well, you start to go by what you have become, what you are. Not by what you know people say you are, not by the titles you have, but what you at the moment can do. So that's a very different way of living life and that is intimately connected to the fact that our reality is being modulated by the digital that we are living half in the virtual half in the real i love it you guys are my new two favorite thinkers <laughs> <That's an honor. laughs> was there anything else that you wanted to get to did you want to show the clips or anything I, 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 Richard, maybe, maybe you can talk. We can talk about the uh, the movie, the vendors movie, just a little bit. Okay, let's. Well, maybe, maybe we can end with that image. But we, you know, we want we this this movie sort of has been um, in the in the shadow for us. That until the end of the world by Vin Vendors, you know, which was four and a half hour movie. <laughs> he spent all this money on it, and never got really much play. But but the one of the. Uh, lines in the story is about a, a man whose mother is blind and his father creates this technology that allows him to use a camera to film people so that the blind mother can then see the people by being hooked up to, you know it's sort of this this futuristic fantasy but then what the what this machine then gets used for is it allows people to see their dreams right so you can then uh have your dreams at night and then play them back on a video. And the characters in the film who have access to the technology, of course, become addicted to the machine. And all they wanna do is to stare at the machine and look at their own dreams and everything else falls. You know, all of empirical reality, eating, sleeping, it becomes like a central addiction. And then, and I think we, we're just trying to say, is there a way that virtual reality kind of it's in its essence it sort of has this promise of allowing us to see our dreams. Because you could say that's the one area of psychic life that's not in some way not available to us because we're split subjects, because when, you're, when the dream is occurring, you're not experiencing it. What you have is when you wake up, you have, you have echoes and traces of it. And it's like virtual reality says, well, we can, we can jump over that and we can be at that moment when wishes are actualized in that instant. And you can have that all the time now. Incredible creative potential of that. And also what has to be disavowed to stay in that world. That, that feels like a fundamental tension that we're trying to explore. And 
especially in the second the second volume we're, we're writing. I look and, forward to that. And you just yeah. saying that for some reason, when you said we're all split subjects, it made me realize that despite all of the psychoanalytic arguments and theorists and everything, that's the thing that makes psychoanalysis like at its core. All psychoanalysts believe yeah. that we're all split subjects, right. no matter what your theoretical orientation, whereas yes. like CBT and other therapists are not yes. coming from that place. But, but isn't it that the, but isn't one of the attractions of virtual reality is that it gives us the illusion that we don't have to be split subjects, that sort of we can have it all psychically. And, and wouldn't you say, wouldn't you say that that has to do with a, a sort of a, a religious instinct in us, that we want to reach the unsayable, the Ascend. unreached. Yeah, <laughs> technology is giving. So uh, 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 I think Brewster is very re relevant here because he says we are at the end of a process, and either we go forward to the abyss or we turn it to our own good. So that we, so that we, I think it, in a way for me, it, I mean, we haven't talked about this, Richard, about the religious part, but I, but I do think that it has to do with a recovery of our relation to mystery, to our relation to, to the unsayable. And that's a religious matter that has been left up in limbo in our time. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion with Drs. Richard Frankel and Victor Krebs. Definitely check out their book, Human Virtuality and Digital Life, Philosophical and Psychoanalytic Investigations. You can follow Dr. Krebs on Instagram and Twitter at Synchronicity23 and visit his website, vjk5555.wixsite.com forward slash portfolio. 
and you can visit the Massachusetts Institute for Psychoanalysis at mipboston.org. And now the song, This is the Subconscious, Your Own Adventure, a collaboration I did with Pete Murphy, available on Highbrow Low Life's Bandcamp page. Just visit highbrowlowlife.bandcamp.com. Enjoy. As the work is recreated through sexual acts. This is the subconscious. This is your own adventure film. This is the eternally projected myth. This is immaculate conception. An umbrella for ecstatic flow. Thank you. This is fire. This is satisfaction as well. This is the time, reality, utopia, technology, a picture postcard, drug, a picture film, postcard, drug, Satan, 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 Satan. This is Satan. sexual. This is the brilliant deviation. This is projection. This is formless. This is progress. This needs to be done further. This is Radio Megagolem.